Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We are going to take a, just a, a few weeks off from Acts. I'm going to finish Acts in November. And to thank you for your past appreciation, I'm going to do a message on politics today. <laughs> Yay! I knew that would come with some mixed reviews, <laughs> some mixed feelings. I do think, though, it would be refreshing for you. I think it would be helpful for all of us as a church. The title is Discerning Political Issues with a Biblical Lens. And I want to help us to make sure we're having a God view on this. We're not God, but get as close as we can to God's view on this season. And we're 15 days away starting today. And I can't wait for it to be over. Not that it will, <laughs> it could take some more time than that. We're 15 days away from the general election on November 5th and I'm praying, we all should be praying, amen. We should be doing our research and, and I feel holy. And by the way, not just for our national level or general election, but even just here at the state local level, amen. We need to be doing our research. And I just feel a holy burden to make sure we keep the main thing the main thing, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ first and foremost. Amen. Amen. And as a follower of God, and as a student and pastor of God's word, I can't help but observe and discern political, uh, the political arena, except with the biblical lens. I, I have to. I, I am a pastor, I am a Christian, I am a follower of God, and so because of that, I look at everything with a biblical lens. Everything. And I want to define politics for you. There's a lot of definitions out there, but the word politics itself is actually a Greek word, and it means science of government and derives from the Greek word politikos, and is first modeled actually in Aristotle's affairs of state. And the adjective politikos comes from polis or politis. Two words used in ancient Greek political thought to describe the concepts of state and citizen respectfully. Now the Cambridge definition gives us a little more clarity on that. Politics are the activities of the government, members of lawmaking organizations or people who try to influence the way a country is governed. That sounds about right. And there's a lot of other definitions as well out there. I wanna give you the biblical worldview. I wanna define that for us and this one's long. And I wanna be foundational here. I wanna help us understand where I'm coming from as a pastor who believes in a biblical worldview. And I believe you do too, amen? A biblical worldview holds to the conviction the Bible is God's revelation of himself and his revealed will for mankind that has established absolute truth, guiding our beliefs, values, views, and decisions. Would you agree with that? A biblical worldview is the frame and foundation by which I view and decide on everything. Therefore, when it comes to life as we know it, this is what we believe according to the Bible, God has always existed. Nothing created God, God is creator. God always existed and God created everything. And he not only created everything, but we need to hold on to this, God in God's world, in this world, everything belongs to him. This is God's earth. This is God's universe. In God's perfect order, he created human beings. He created male and female according to our scripture. And instituted marriage to unite one man and one woman together. Genesis 2, 21 through 25. God blessed them and gave them this mandate, be fruitful and multiply, procreate. He said, fill the earth and govern it, even reign over all the living creatures in the water and on the ground. How many fishermen like that? God even provided the means to complete their tasks by giving them seed bearing plants and a chain of food for every creature. So he provided for us so that we could continue and so could creation continue on and on and on. That was his will that we live on. Lastly, God looked over everything he had made and saw that it was very good. 
and the order of institutions was perfect. God first, supreme over all. He created human beings. He created marriage and family. And then once we had enough family, he gave authority. He gave authority in the beginning, but then once we had enough people on the earth, he gave authority to man to represent God on earth and govern over the earth. So later on, we have a government. So first we have God, we have mankind, the family unit, we have marriage, and then later on, we have the government made up of people. We the people. But then came the fall of man. (laughs) Then came the garden, where mankind fell into sin and did not submit to God's authority. And therefore, disorder and conflict entered our world. And because of sin, the whole earth was subject to God's punishment and the curse of sin led to struggling with the devil. This is literally in our scriptures. In Genesis 3, a struggle with the devil, struggling with relationships between Adam and Eve and marriages, difficulty in procreation, and struggle with the ground to produce crops. The scripture literally says that it would be hard for Adam to produce crops. The land would not give up the crops. The worst effects, most of all though, were distance from God and wrestling with the sinful nature. We were banned from the garden. And then we wrestled with the sinful nature and we know what happens next, Cain and Abel. And Cain wrestled with that sinful nature and killed his brother, Abel. This was the birth of sin and the havoc it has created has rippled throughout humanity, including the issues we are seeing today in our society. To bring order, God would later establish the institution of government with the responsibility to uphold justice and order in society. In his kingdom on earth, God gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, to define what is right and wrong and spelled out in more detail in the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Pentateuch. And in those, in those books, we learn the ways to render justice when things are off or wrong, when things have been broken. These foundational laws from God have served as a guide for thousands of years in our world, haven't they? Including the founding fathers of our nation. But as our society moves further and further away from fearing and worshiping God, these essential laws have faded into the background and our society is paying the price for it. God has been slowly pushed out of our lives and our governments. Meanwhile, the Bible says this about God. You ready? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Look at that. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unloving or un, unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Why do I show you the scripture? To bring order back into our nation, our world, and our own lives, the answer is putting God back on the throne of our hearts and letting him lead us again. Amen. Amen. The foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. In other words, if someone knows how to make sure everything is happening properly, everything is in order and working, wouldn't it be God? So shouldn't he stay on the throne of our hearts and even in our government? God put something on my heart today and I'll be honest with you, I have felt this for weeks. There's groans for righteousness and salvation. Our world is groaning for things to be made right. Scripture in Romans 8, I'm going to start with 19, but verse 18 says, Yet we suffer now, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. But starting with verse 19, it says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, 
The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Look at verse 22. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Isn't that true? Amen. Last night, <laughs> this is a funny note. Last night, we celebrated my father's 75th birthday. Yeah. And my brother and I both sat down at the same time at different tables at Hibachi, and we both groaned on our way down. <laughs> and I couldn't help but chuckle and laugh. I was like, oh, Lord, don't let it be. <laughs> like, ah, yeah. Our bodies are groaning for heaven, <laughs> for a new body. <laughs> But it says, and just so you know, this is the whole world. This isn't just Christians. The whole world is groaning. Even if you're not a Christian, you're groaning for something. They don't, the world doesn't realize what they're groaning for is the righteousness and justice of God. To fix what was broken in the garden, to be restored, for salvation to come. And there's good news for us. And, and this is why I want to make sure we keep a proper perspective during this season because I want everyone to have this hope that everything will be restored. And it, it continues in verse 23. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have, we must wait patiently and confidently. In verse 20, it says, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. In the NIV, it says, subject to frustration. Creation was unable to fulfill its original purpose in the way it could have. It's frustrated. The world fell into a bondage of decay. It's not operating the way it should be. The birth pains imagery in the scripture is used elsewhere to describe conditions in the end times, like Matthew 24, 8 or John 16, 21. And groaning expresses a deep longing for the fulfillment of God's promises for all things to be restored, for a new heavens and a new earth. All creation is groaning and crying out for deliverance from sin. All creation is groaning for the curse to be lifted. It's the punishment upon mankind because of what we did. All creation is groaning for justice and righteousness to rule. All creation is groaning for all things to be restored. In other words, all creation, even nature, wants salvation to come. Consider the weather we have been seeing in our world. I don't jump on certain bandwagons of certain things you see on social media or the world without you know, triple checking at times, but it is interesting when there's flooding in the Sahara Desert, when water is returning. It is interesting to see a snowstorm in South Africa or North Africa, wherever that was. It, that is interesting. It, it has happened, but is it, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how many tornadoes, how many hurricanes, how much flooding is going on around the world. It appears also that there's struggles even in the ocean with the amount of fish or not. But the Lord continues to take care of us somehow. But all of creation is groaning, isn't it? What about the issues of our election? The issues of our election are groaning for righteousness, justice, and order, even if people don't realize it, even if people don't have a biblical worldview, even if they don't care about God, they are actually groaning for everything to be made right. Wars. It's the groaning of our nation and our world. Corruption. I'm grieved over the corruption in our nation. It bothers me. 
You heard my perspective on abortion recently. What about violence to women? Doesn't that bother us? What about lawlessness? What about inflation? And by the way, violence to anyone. Violence in general. The breakdown of family. The wrestling of gender and sexual identity. Poverty. Crime. Drugs. Here's one that we don't like to talk about as Americans, greed. What about hunger and homelessness? What about the issues of illegal immigration or trying to help those in need? What do we do with all these things? They are so complex, aren't they? If we were to unpoliticize the election issues and look from a biblical worldview again, what do we have? We have issues and injustices spurred on by sin and wickedness. That's the reality. My friends, can we please take off our political lens for a moment and please look at these issues. We have an issue with sin. The effects of sin from the garden until the day Jesus comes back and makes everything right, we are going to live with. We have a sin problem and I'm not anti-government when I say this because God actually gave government. So don't take my words and misconstrue them. But we have a sin problem. And what's our hope every four years? A political figure and platform. That's, that was a little quiet in here. And I'm not surprised that sin isn't considered the issue because we live in a humanistic society that longs to do whatever we desire. And we've written off sin as if it has no consequence. This is the society we live in, a humanistic society. I'm not surprised that political figures have become the hope of our nation instead of God because he has become an afterthought in our nation. Way too much. Our society is looking to remedy spiritual and systemic issues with policies, but without the wisdom and righteousness of God. I'm right, ain't I? And let me tell you something. And I'll correct that statement. God's right. He tries to say this in scripture again and again to his people in the Old Testament. Come back to me. I feel for politicians. I feel for them. I'm a pastor of this church and it is hard to make decisions and to help people with the complex issues they have. You know how hard it is to deal with those who don't have a biblical worldview and those who do and those who have different other religion views? You know how hard it must be to be a politician in our world? I think that's why the Bible says pray for them. But I, I, and, I, and I pray for our, our political leaders, I pray for our government officials, but I have to say this, it's gonna, be, it's, continue to, it's gonna continue to be difficult if you don't seek the face of God and ask for his help. It's gonna be difficult. Policies will continue to pass in our nation, but they still won't fix what's happening beneath the surface spiritually. What we need is God back in our lives, first of all, our lives. And thank God he hasn't left yours and you haven't pushed him out if you haven't, praise the Lord. We need him in our homes. We need God in our schools. We need God in our government and in our policies. We do. Our nation needs God's righteousness and justice to make things right and restore order. It's all out of order. Proverbs 29.2 says this, and this is not a hit on our current leadership. This is for all times and this is for all situations. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, they groan. Groaning. Why do I say this? Because righteousness matters in leadership. It matters right here in this platform that I am a righteous person. It matters as a parent that you are righteous. It matters if you're a school principal, if you're righteous, it matters. They may not believe that, but to God, it matters. 
your workplace, if you're a boss, your righteousness matters. And the same thing in our government. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation. It lifts it up. But sin condemns any people. The New Living Translation says, godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. See, godliness helps a nation thrive. Sin hurts a nation. Isaiah 32, 17, for the fruit of righteousness will be peace. How many want peace? Oh, Lord, give us peace. Its effects will be quietness and confidence forever. There's stability with righteousness. There's calmness. There's stability with righteousness. Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. This is why we want God back in our lives and in our government. Righteousness matters. And when a nation's way of life and policies follow God's standards, the nation will be blessed. Can I get an amen? And there's two ways, and there's, well, there's many ways, but I'm going to just focus on two ways that we can help our nation, and the order is critical. First and foremost, and the most important, we share and lead our communities to Jesus. This has to be our primary focus above everything else. It has to be above even our political engagement, amen? Amen. Our nation needs the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform hearts and the church of Jesus Christ to transform communities. Yes, we reach one person at a time and then we as a church change an entire community by helping our community. Even our local government officials. Next week, we're gonna have a great speaker. My friend Jonathan Quintel is gonna be here and he's gonna share about his mission field in our Congress here in our state, downtown Dover at Legislative Hall, what he's doing to minister to those in our government. Amen, isn't that gonna be cool? It's gonna be so good. You're gonna wanna be here next week to hear him and even our role and what we can do to help. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you heard me say this a couple weeks ago. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? In other words, stay, this does not sound right today, stay salty, because that's been twisted (laughs) to be mean. (laughs) That's not what I mean. (laughs) Stay effective for the Lord. Keep the Lord, keep your conscience. Be holy for the Lord. It is no longer good for anything except for to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. See, we're supposed to bring light into our homes and in our world because we're the light of the world. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, how you live matters. Living righteous matters. And if we live righteous, it will help lead people to Jesus Christ. One day they will glorify the Lord as well. They will praise him and they will live for him. And my friends, we have a lot of work to do. Can I read to you some stats? First of all, from the American Bible Society, only 38% of Americans adult, uh, adults engage with the Bible. I'm starting to learn that I need to, I need to type this out in bigger print. <laughs> it's two times now today. Only 38% of American adults engage with the Bible. Only thir- this is Americans. Only 50% of American adults embrace the two, true nature of God. believe Jesus is the only way for salvation. 27% recognize humans as sinful. Well, there you go. There's that. 
That's why we don't see righteousness as important. 46% accept the Bible as true and reliable. That's not, that's not a lot. I mean, it's, that's not bad, but it could be a lot more. A slim 25% believe in absolute truth rooted in the Bible. Yikes. Most Americans, 68%, still consider themselves to be Christians. You ready for this one? Among these self-identified Christians, though, only 6% have a biblical worldview. This is from Barna Research in 2023. I just read to you a biblical worldview in the beginning of my sermon. 6% of the 68% of Christians, that's not good. So we have a problem even in the Christian church, not just in America, not just in our citizens. So we have work to do, don't we? And that's okay, I'm up for the task, are you? Actually, let me give you some positive, uh, a positive look at this. If the world has become less godly, that means the opportunity to make a difference is greater. <laughs> Think about that. That means there's more people that you're gonna come in contact with that need Jesus Christ, amen? And I just wanna encourage us that we must listen to the groans of our society and help it by sharing Jesus and showing the love of God. The struggles and pain caused by wickedness will not be cured by politics. It will only be cured by Jesus Christ, amen? amen. This order is important. We first must focus on and make sure we're doing a good job of showing the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus Christ to our community, amen? amen. That must be first and foremost but it doesn't mean we don't care about the government. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't engage in the elections. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be voting. We should do all those things. I am a proponent of both. It's not either or. We live in America. We have a right to also make a difference in our community through the government, amen? So secondly, we advocate for God's righteousness and justice to be in our government's offices and policies. Think about this for a moment. More Christians in government offices. Sounds like a novel idea. But here's the thing. If only 6% of them have a biblical worldview, what do you do? So we have an issue in the church where we need to get back to the word of God as the absolute truth starting with our children and teaching them what the word of God says and not questioning everything it says and trusting the Lord at his word. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's healthy to make sure you understand what you are reading and what you believe. But to deny everything that the word of God says is not gonna help the situation in our nation and most of all in our homes, amen? We must be on the same page with God. We believe a nation is blessed whose God is Lord. If we don't advocate for the righteousness of God, you know what will happen? The devil will continue to bring disorder and chaos in our world. You know, he's already doing that, right? So if we do nothing, he's just gonna have a heyday. The devil knows how to influence a society. He knows that he can influence an entire nation if he occupies places of power and influence. You don't think he's doing that right now? Around the world? He's doing it around the world, not just in our nation. He is occupying places of leadership and influence, places of power. That's what the devil does. And so my friends, the notion that we as Christians shouldn't do the same is crazy to me. I don't understand that. We should be Christian politicians. We should be Christian government leaders because you can't take Christianity off of your life just because you go into a new position. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, you get to be a Christian mechanic, a Christian coach, 
a Christian doctor, a Christian teacher, thank God, a Christian nurse. Oh man, I hear so many amazing testimonies from you nurses where you pray for people in the hospital. Thank you so much. We have Christians in office right now in Delaware and we wanna see more people. Now, hear me out, okay? Hear me out. We wanna see more people saved by Jesus Christ, not so that our political party can win. Don't get it twisted. No, so that we can see people in heaven with us. Amen. But if we believe that God's goodness and love and truth and God's policies are good, wouldn't we want that too for everyone here on earth right now? Yeah, I know I do. God's been groaning through me. I feel like God has been wanting to just, for me to just speak my heart on this. God wants people to experience his righteousness right here now, not just until in heaven, not waiting until heaven. We get to experience his righteousness now. And if we have righteous policies in our government, people will experience the goodness of God and they will be drawn to God too. But the first and most important way of doing it is no doubt us bringing the Bible to our friends, not us bringing our political opinions. I wanna make sure I'm clear on that. (laughs) Now, if Christians do not engage and advocate in our government, then those who ignore God and defy his word will. It's that simple, my friends. If there's a void, someone or something fills it, don't they? So we should engage. And I wanna expose something and I can tell I was dealing with spiritual warfare all week. I was questioning everything. This is spiritual warfare, my friends. I'm not trying to hypersensitization or show hypersensitization on this or, or overdo this, okay, I'm not. Take away the political lens of this. Look at this biblically. Okay? The devil has long used political agendas to cultivate compromise in the church. Because like we, we believe this. We believe this word. But then when the culture around us had different opinions on this, and then put them into policies, suddenly Christians started questioning everything that was in this. And not just did the devil do that in politics, but he did it in churches. Because now churches have turned their back on God and his word, and now they're teaching things that are completely unbiblical. It is, that's the worst one for me personally, as a pastor, to see churches abandon the word of God to make everyone feel good about their life. That's concerning. And the devil did not want me to say that today. Be careful, my friends. He is slick. He's a snake. He knows how to influence this culture and he will even use Christian leaders or counterfeits and he will use politics. He already has. This is why the church of Jesus Christ, I'm gonna land the plane here, okay? You ready? You guys have been great. Thank you for hearing me out. Most of all, thank you for hearing the word of God. This is why the church of Jesus Christ must hold on to a biblical worldview and help influence this nation with the righteousness and justice of God. If the church of Jesus Christ will shine the truth and righteousness of the gospel in every place possible, we will help our world experience the blessing of righteousness in this world and in eternal life to come. I joined Jonathan Quitella at Legislative Hall during business sessions a month or so ago. And he'll have plenty of stories to share next week if he has the time, but We prayed with two senators. It 
It was powerful. With one of them, we got to read scripture and explain it to him. That's amazing. There was no political agenda in that. It was all about their heart. It was all about where they are in eternity. Where would they be when they pass away? Or where would they be? Or what would happen to them if Jesus comes back? It was beautiful. I, I just can't wait for you to hear Jonathan next week. And I was impacted deeply. I'll be honest with you, I was very attracted to this work. And I, and I want to say this too. If the, Lord were to, if the Lord were to call me to be involved in the government, I would probably do it. Because people need Jesus. People need Jesus. But I know for sure I'm here. <laughs> I know for sure he's called me to be a pastor, but I think there could be more pastors in our government to help guide these people who are dealing with complex issues that, that, that need godly wisdom and godly perspective. It is so hard. Because if you were to look at both sides of the aisle, they're both groaning for something to be fixed. And we know the answer is the gospel. I wanna close with this prayer that has been guiding me and helping me. Matthew 6, 9 and 10. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wow. Oh Lord, we want, we want your kingdom here on earth. Your kingdom's the greatest kingdom, God. Why don't we stand together and just pray that? Let's, let's stand together as we close. If you can, let's stand. We want to be a light in every dark place, amen? That's what this is about. And we want his kingdom to come in our hearts. If today's communion time and scripture spoke to you, if this sermon speaking to your heart about being right with God, I wanna encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ today, to confess him as your Lord and savior. And to let us know, because we wanna pray with you. Actually, our prayer team will stay here and we wanna pray with you if you need prayer over that. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be here. If your home is dealing with the effects of sin in such a terrible way, and you need righteousness and justice to take place for whatever it is. Now, don't even think political or government. Just think of anything. Something's not right in my life. Something's not right in my home. We want to pray for you. And that really could be all of us right now. So we're going to create an altar in this room too. And think about that for a second. Is there something not right that needs to be fixed? Starting with me. Starting with my home, my friends, my family my coworkers, the answer is going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And what makes things right again is the righteousness of God. Think about this for a moment. The righteousness of God is humility. So apologizing. Doesn't that sound like that would make things right, hopefully? Yeah. And then what else is righteousness? Forgiveness when someone apologizes. That's righteousness. If there's something broken in your marriage, relationship with a family member, go do the righteous thing. Amen? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's say it again, ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want your will to be done here on earth, starting with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, starting in us. And Lord, I pray God that through us would be the salt and light to our neighbors, our families, our coworkers, even our, our elected officials, God. Oh Lord, we pray for them right now. God, would you get a hold of their hearts? Lord, those who are far from you, Lord, have mercy on them and bring them close to you, God. Lord, get their attention. 
Use, Lord, the, the Jonathan Quintellas and, and the church body in our nation, Lord, to reach those who are dealing with complex issues and need your wisdom, your guidance, and your word to deal with them. But God, we're gonna focus first and foremost on the most important way, and that's reaching one life at a time. Not for the sake of some worldly kingdom, but for the sake of your kingdom. And that people would experience the goodness and the power and the love of your kingdom. Oh Lord, I pray that your kingdom would rise above all other kingdoms. Lord, I pray that we would put you back on the throne of our hearts. And Lord, as we lead by example, people will see your goodness, your light, your character, and they will glorify you. They will call out to you, believe in you, and be saved and live a life that glorifies you too. In other words, God, light is gonna spread. Your kingdom is gonna spread in every place. Lord, I pray you'd be with everyone here who's feeling like something's not right in their life. Something's not right in our kids. Something's not right in our homes. Lord, we know the answer is your presence. Lord, we invite you into our lives more and more. We invite you into our homes more and more. And Lord, I pray that our government leaders, Lord, our elected officials will invite you in again. And Lord, help us to lead away with humility, with grace, and with truth. We will stand on the truth of your word, but we will do it with gentleness and grace. Help us to be that way in our community today. And Lord, in our entire week. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we have hope that the groaning that we are seeing will be restored one day. That Lord, that the things that we're going through, what we really long for, the righteousness and justice, it will all be fixed. We thank you, God. And we have hope for that day when our bodies will be made new, when we will experience our sonship, our daughtership, our adoption. And Lord, I pray for those who don't know you, God, that you would draw them to you, even in the, in the hearing of my words right now, that you would use the scriptures to draw them to you, God, so they would have a hope as well. And we look forward to that day when you come and take your church. Thank you for your return, Lord. We're looking forward to it. But in the meantime, we're going to do everything you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.